Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 6th of September. And actually quite a lot of stuff has gone on in the last week, including kind of a, a special new thing that's been released in an early preview that I wanted to cover. As always, if this is useful, please like, subscribe, comment, and share. Uh, new videos this week, I did a deep dive on Azure DNS. So you think about private DNS zones, public DNS using custom DNS, and how they can kind of work together. And I also released a few kind of virtual mentoring videos that some people have asked about, and so I kind of put those out there as well. Microsoft Ignite is available for sign up. So it is free, so I can go and sign up for free registration. There's the link. And it's gonna run September 22nd to the 24th. So lots of good technical sessions online, free of charge, so go get registered. Azure Biosep, what is this? So this is a new DSL for deploying. So it's not a general purpose language, it's specific just to Azure. And if we think about provisioning resources in Azure, yes, I can use the portal, I can use the CLI, I can use PowerShell, but we prefer declarative. This has been things like Azure JSON ARM templates, or maybe Terraform for a third party solution. And one of the challenges with ARM templates, they were very, very verbose. They were not really very nice to actually author. And so this new is a very early version. It's the point one. It's only out there to try and get feedback to Microsoft about this new way to provision resources in a declarative manner. It's a simpler syntax. It's a simpler authoring solution. Now today, it basically compiles to JSON. So you can think about JSON is that intermediary language it's actually gonna to compile to. So I don't deploy a bicep straight to Azure. I actually compile the bicep file to an ARM template, then I deploy the ARM template to Azure. But it gives me a simpler authoring experience. It's out there on GitHub. And as part of that, there's actually a great complete walkthrough. So it will go through all the key kind of components. But today, really anything I can do in ARM, those contracts are kind of shown through the bicep as well. It's really transparent in that regard. But do not use it in production. This is strictly a, hey, I wanna kind of go and see this thing. I'm curious about what's coming down the road as a new way to author. But again, it's still using ARM. It's just, this is a new way we can kind of actually go and author these things. So I'll show you one quickly. So if I jump over to VS Code, there is a VS Code extension for this as well. So you install Bicep, you install the VS Code extension. And what we can see here is this creates a storage account. This has parameters, it has variables, it has the resource, it has output. Now, if we actually go ahead and look at the details, so we can see here initially I have parameters. So I've got the kind of parameter keyword, I have the name of the parameter, and then it's type, in this case kind of string. Then I have variables, so I have a storage skew. Notice I can have comments. Then I have the resource keyword, and then this STG. This is really just a symbolic name for that resource within the bicep file. It's not gonna be used for the actual naming of the resource in any way. It's strictly here that I can use that name, that SDG, in other places in the file. For example, when I wanna output the ID of the storage account, I can just reference it again. So this is something that will be familiar if you've used Terraform in the past. So I'm actually giving it a name. And then I just have the type of resource. In this case, it's from the Microsoft Storage Resource Provider. It's a storage account. And then the API version. And then I have the various parameters, name. And here, I don't have to say, hey, it's a parameter. I can just use it. So I can't have the same name for a parameter and a variable. They have to be unique. So it's automatically gonna use the parameter then it's gonna use the parameter for location, then it's gonna use the variable for here. So this is a complete bicep file. And then if we actually go ahead and look over in the files I have, there's no JSON file. If I look over here on this left side, you can see there is no JSON file. 
So I'll run this bicep build command. You can see this executes. And now on the left side, you can see I now have a JSON file. And this really helps me see how much nicer that bicep file is. So this is what it outputted. It's exactly the same code. You can see, well, I have the parameters. These all match to what those parameters I had originally were. See, lots more code in the JSON. We can see, hey, look, I have a variable. Then I have my resource. And then remember, we have that nice kind of symbolic name. Well, in the JSON file, it doesn't have that. It has to reference the complete resource that it went ahead and created. So again, this is super, super early days. This is not something that we're gonna go ahead and use in production yet, but it's there. Maybe go and have a little play with it. On the compute side, so Azure Durable Functions versus 2.3. So remember, Azure Functions Durable are all about long running uh, types of serverless compute that I want. I can go and trigger other things. I can resume based on certain events. And in this 2.3, it really focused on having better support for kind of geo-redundant. Um, I have the concept of a task hub. This is a logical container. It uses things like a storage account for queues, etc. Well, now I can't have two things with the same name accessing the same task hub to better protect against maybe two functions in different locations trying to do the same thing. It's also better partitioning to try and avoid now, hey, look, if I'm scaling out a durable serverless function, doing that scale out, sometimes the same thing could run twice. This new partitioning will help kind of stop that. And uh, there used to be a six day maximum duration limit, that's gone. On the AKS side, really two key uh, common vulnerability and exposure fixes. So there's this privilege escalation fix that's rolling out. This is for any GA AKS version. This was basically if one node got compromised, well, there was a way I could maybe go and compromise other nodes through various certificates. So this fixes that. There's also a node disk denial of service kind of fix that's been rolled out. And although it automatically will roll out in terms of AKS updates, you have to user initiate the actual upgrade of the components. So you realize there's an action on you to go and check, hey, um, where is this fixed? What version? And it, there's a fix all the way back to 1.15, so 1.16, 17, 18 as well. But you do need to go and do something to actually go and initiate the upgrade of the components to stop when you have these kind of privileged um, pods. Networking. Uh, Azure Data Factory now has private link support. Now, previously I talked about the kind of managed VNet that enabled me to consume and create private endpoints for other services and be used by Data Factory. This is now actually from my VNet. This is now how I can actually go and talk to the Data Factory control plane. So I can do things like um, authoring, monitoring, uh, the self-hosted integration runtime. So Azure Data Factory has to work with data sources. There's an Azure hosted service. But if I have like private data sources, maybe on premises, things that require me to bring my own driver, then I can use the self-hosted agent. So in this case, that self-hosted integration runtime, hey, I, I can leverage that through the private endpoint. Now, this is a work in progress. There is still certain things I can't do with the private endpoint. Um, if I'm doing kind of interactive authoring with the self-hosted integration runtime, that doesn't work yet through the private endpoint. If I have that um, integration runtime auto update through like Windows Update, for example, uh, that's not going to auto update yet either. So a few things that are still to come. Um, Azure DNS, this is for public DNS zones has a simpler child zone. So remember, DNS is hierarchical. If I think about the way I have my DNS, I can have, I remember, might have like com at the top, and then that delegates a portion of the namespace to maybe Savletech. So that would be Savletech.com. Well, I could create a child partition, maybe dev. And when I do that delegation, there are certain records I have to create in the parent zone say, well, this 
These servers are now authority for this portion of the namespace. There are various records I have to create. So what's happening now is if I actually just jump over, let's look at DNS for a second, and I look at kind of my public DNS zones, and there's a zone, I actually have this nice add child zone option. So here you can see I have this child zone option at the top. Now, if I select that and create a child zone, it will go and create all of the records in the parent that I actually need to make this work. So we're getting a much better experience there. On the storage side, um, Azure SQL Managed Instance now has a user initiated failover. Now, ordinarily with Azure SQL Database, I don't worry about this stuff. If it's a single database, if it's an elastic pool, if it's managed instance, it does the work for me. But if I actually wanna be able to test the failover experience, well, now we can. So on single database, elastic pool, and now managed instance, there's a CLI command, there's a REST API, there's a PowerShell command to actually trigger the failover. Now, Azure Cost Management has a bunch of updates. There's an AWS connector now in GA. It's been in preview for a long time. I can now connect the Azure Cost Management to AWS, and now I can actually start seeing things about, hey, what are my costs at various different levels, like the management groups, the accounts, etc. I can combine them. I can set budgets so I can trigger kinds of alerts. This is free for, I think, the first 90 days, and then it's a paid service. I think it's it costs 1% of kind of that managed spend to use in AWS. There are new scheduling options for export from Azure Cost Management. So it's better weekly and monthly kind of options. I can pick the start date, so I have better control when this is gonna run. Uh, I can do a one-time export of like three months of data now. So some cool new export options. And one of the things cost management does is now it's going to have various recommendations. So now when I purchase those various types of reservation, for example, it could be virtual machines, it could be database. When I do the purchase, it will actually now show me a recommended quantity based on what it's seen me use. And I can even click that recommended quantity and it will show me why it's recommended that value, show me the charts of what it's seen to come to that kind of conclusion. Um, Azure Migrate now supports availability zones. So if we remember, Azure Migrate is all about the idea that, hey, I have resources. Now these resources could be running on a hypervisor. So it could be Hyper-V, it could be ESX. And so at the hypervisor level, I can replicate virtual machines without any agent. For both Hyper-V and ESX, it uses a snapshot and then change block tracking. Or for physical machines, or for machines in other clouds, or even in Hyper-V ESX, there's the option of kind of running an in-guest kind of agent, and it can use those to migrate to Azure. And what I can do now is if you think about a region, many of them now support availability zones, um, different facilities with independent calling, power, communications. As part of my migrate settings, I can now pick, hey, I want this one to go to kind of AZ1, this one to AZ2, this one to AZ3. So I have that better protection from a blast radius perspective when I'm moving my workloads up to Azure. So as part of my Azure migrate, um, I can go ahead and pick my availability zone. Um, Azure Monitor has some new data collection update capabilities. This is in preview. And a lot of this is built around these new data collection rules. So what I can now do is I can create these data collection rules and I can say, hey, I want to send data to log analytics and Azure Monitor metrics. I want to scope the data collection now to a subset of virtual machines. I can now multi-home Linux agents. Same thing I could do with Windows, I couldn't do with Linux. Well, I can now do that. I have better event filtering for Windows. And the way this is really working is if we jump over to the portal again, and if we look at monitor, 
we have these data collection rules. And as part of a data collection rule, I can go ahead, it doesn't really matter what I pick here, but notice now I can add virtual machines that are in kind of the scope of this preview. So right now I'm limited to what I have. I'll just pick this one. And then what I can do is I can say, well, what data sources am I thinking about? Are these performance counters? Are they Windows event logs? Are they Linux syslogs? If it's something like performance counters that can go to log analytics and metrics, if I, if I pick that, I can tune the ones I want. But notice if it was event logs, I could tune exactly what. I could do custom, etc. And then as part of these, I can pick where I want it to go to. Sure, Azure Monitor metrics. Hey, maybe also Azure Monitor logs, etc. And so when I do all of those things, so I'll just actually remove that one. Once I've done that, now I could actually deploy and it's going to be tuned to the VMs I actually selected. So I'm now tuning what I'm actually going to deploy to, not every single virtual machine. As a security center, now the security findings can be part of a continuous export. That's a feature of Azure Security Center. I now have this asset inventory. This is preview. And basically the idea of this is anything that is connected to Azure Security Center, and so I've got my inventory preview, it will now kind of show me from a security posture perspective where I am. So I can go and look at, and it's, again, it's anything, it doesn't have to be in Azure, anything I've got connected to Azure Security Center through this inventory preview, it will now kind of show me um, this information. So a nice little extra bit. Um, security defaults is now a recommendation. So previously it would kind of say, hey, um, you should use conditional access and MFA. Well, now if I'm on the free tier, I don't have conditional access. It will now say, hey, turn on security defaults. Security defaults is a far more broader um, basically turning on MFA for key types of access and resource. It's also going to now recommend to switch from management certificates. I didn't know anyone used these anymore. This was the old, old way that I could give something access to Azure, maybe like an automation script, but it was very broad in scope. I could really do anything I want. Um, service principles are far more granular, like I'm registering an application essentially. I can use a certificate or I can use a secret as part of that authentication. So you can see we had quite a lot of stuff this week. Um, as always, if there's any questions on this, if I've missed anything, uh, please kind of comment below. But until next time, stay safe, take care of yourselves.